Hello, hello, wonderful to have you here. On today's video, what I want to do is discuss the Buddha's wisest female disciple, a woman named Bhikkhuni Kema. Bhikkhuni means a nun, female monastic. And uh, some of you will know that in a number of my recent videos, I've discussed important people in early Buddhism, uh, monastics or lay people. So far, these have all been guys. If I've done, uh, that is to say, whole videos on one person, they've been guys. And one of my viewers, a woman named Yobimbe, had a very important thing to say, which was that she was enjoying these, but she was looking forward to a video on Bhikkhuni Kema and the other female disciples. Uh, there's a reason why I've, I've had to stick to male disciples, which is that the early material, the material from early Buddhism, is indeed somewhat or I should say significantly, uh, androcentric. That is to say, it follows the lives of men much more than it does the lives of women. So if you're looking for a detailed history of a person's life, it's going to be a man. There are, very few, there are essentially no very detailed histories of women's lives in the early suttas. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's worth making an effort here. Before I get to that, though, just, uh, just a reminder that I have a new book out just now, and I'll leave a link to it down below, and also here's what it looks like. It's a, a history, uh, a, a poem from early Buddhism that illustrates, I think, the most complex, the most detailed path of practice that's open to a layperson. In other words, there's much more about the lay life and how we can practice uh, the Buddha Dharma as lay people in this poem than there is, I think, anywhere else in the early material. Also, if you're, if you're new to this channel of mine and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, which is what we try to do here, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications uh, when I come out with new videos. Uh, so with all that out of the way, uh, Bhikkhuni Kema. Now, she was known as the, the Buddha's wisest disciple. Indeed, that was what the Buddha said about her. And in that, she could, she could be compared to Sariputta, who was the wisest male disciple. And indeed, the Buddha sort of uh, seems to have set up, uh, you know, he would, in certain uh, early suttas, would talk about the wisest male and wisest female disciple and so on. And so she has a really important role to play in that sense. It's, in a, it's too... It's, uh, I was going to say, too bad. It's unfortunate that re we really don't have more information about her in the early suttas. Uh, nevertheless, what I'll try to do here is discuss some of her history. What we do have is a single sutta that describes a talk she had with King Pisanidhi. And this sutta is what I'll be discussing here. It apparently only exists in the Pali tradition. It does not exist, so far as I know, in the other recensions, that is to say, in the other copies, which leads us to wonder, why not? Uh, was it eliminated, let's say, from other recensions, from other uh, uh, histories of these suttas that were translated into Chinese and other languages? Or is it something that was made up in the Pali tradition later on? My guess is the former rather than the latter, given the history of Buddhism, but I really don't know for sure. So that's one sutta that we have. We also have her poem in the Terigata. Now, the Terigata is, a, is the earliest collection of women's literature in the world, perhaps, uh, literature written by women, and these are poems written by the early Buddhist uh, female monastics. And Bhikkhuni Kema also has a poem there, which I'll be discussing. But neither of these two sources contain very much at all about her life. If we want to find out about her life, uh, there really isn't any source in the early material. What we have to do is to go to the commentaries. The commentaries on the suttas, this is later material uh, in the Pali tradition. It's a sectarian material from the Theravada, material, Theravada tradition that was written later. Now, in these video, uh, videos of mine, I tend to try to, I try to not discuss too much of the commentarial material because it's less uh, uh, credible, or it's less, uh, it's, it's not as good a historical source for early Buddhism. 
Uh, some of the material may be indeed early. It may go back to that early tradition, but some of it clearly does not. And some of it does indeed appear to be sort of just-so stories written at a later date, sort of stories that have been uh, concocted uh, out of perhaps whole cloth by later, uh, by later monastics attempting to fill out stories that simply didn't exist. It's impossible to say for sure with any given uh, a story, although some of them are, are, are better than others, or at least more convincing than others. In any event, uh, Bhikkhuni Kema was said to be, in the commentaries, said to be very beautiful, and said to be one of the main consorts of King Bimbisara who, of Magadha, who was a king at the time. So she's said to be this person of some importance. And again, in the commentaries, it's said that uh, King Bimbisara wanted her to meet the Buddha. Uh, so, I mean, he was himself uh, a, a fan of the Buddha. He liked what the Buddha had to say and felt that his consort should meet him. On the other hand, it's said that she, Kema, didn't want to meet the Buddha because she was concerned that the Buddha would not approve of her vanity. In other words, she seems to have been, when she was younger, very vain, very aware of her own beauty, very attached to it, and she had a feeling that the Buddha didn't really approve of such a thing and, and didn't approve of beauty in general, she seems to have felt. And so she wasn't really uh, very happy about that. She was reluctant to go and see him, and so uh, Bimbisara had to sort of pressure her uh, with sort of subterfuges in order to get her to meet the Buddha. In any event, eventually she did meet the Buddha, and she went and, and, and listened to a talk, a Dharma talk given by him. Uh, the exact subject of the Dharma talk isn't important. What is important, though, is that in the commentaries it's said that while he gave this talk to Kema, the Buddha created a sort of a mental image, a, 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 an illusory image of a very, of an extremely beautiful woman next to him who was fanning him while he was giving the talk. And so Kema saw this beautiful woman next to the Buddha and felt somewhat more at ease, feeling like, okay, so the Buddha's not averse to having beautiful women near him, so perhaps it's okay for me to be here. You know, she wouldn't have felt so out of place. However, it's said that during the talk that the Buddha gave, this uh, illusion that the Buddha had created, this beautiful woman, got older and older and older, and less and less beautiful. And she became more and more aged, until by the end of the talk she, she died. She sort of fell over dead. Uh, now we have to assume, I guess, that she disappeared because there was no great commotion or anything like that. Um, but in any event, what it said is that Bhikkhuni Kema uh, saw this uh, illusion, this, this change in this beautiful woman over the period of the talk, and that it changed her, that she began to realize, see directly, the dangers in vanity, in being vain about our appearance, because our appearance is going to change. And if we become too attached to youthful beauty, we're going to be disappointed in very short order. Um, so it's said that uh, this, as I say, this, this talk of the Buddha changed her and she decided to join the monastery. So that's the material from the commentaries. Now to turn to the suttas. There is this one uh, important sutta that uh, Bhikkhuni Kema has where she has a discussion with King Pasenadi, who is another one of the um, Buddhist disciples, who was a, Buddha, a king who was very uh, interested in what the Buddha had to say. And it's said that Pasenadi was, I guess, sitting around one day and wanted to hear a Dharma talk, but the Buddha was not in town and none of his uh, uh, sort of higher-end monastics were around. And but he, he had a, uh, a person who went out to scout for him, and, and this person found that Bhikkhuni Kemo was there. And so he came back to King Basanidhi and said, well, you know, all the, the male monastics are not around, but there's this female monastic, uh, Bhikkhuni Kema, who people speak very highly of, who's supposed to be extremely wise and, and extremely knowledgeable, so why don't you go and talk with her? And King Basanidhi was very happy to do that, so he went over to Bhikkhuni Kema. And the discussion they had was about one particular topic, 
which is a very deep um, and confusing topic in early Buddhism, and clearly something that confused King Pasenadi as well. And this is the topic of the unanswered questions. Uh, some of you will know that there are certain questions, metaphysical, deep ontological questions, that the Buddha basically refused to answer. And I've done a separate video on that, and I'll leave a link to the video down below if you want to know more about, about those questions. But some of the, or one of the questions had to do with what happens to an enlightened being, such as the Buddha, what happens to an enlightened being after they die? Uh, we might say that there are various possibilities. Uh, either the enlightened person exists after death in some respect, or they don't exist after death, or they, in some respects, exist and don't exist after death, depending on how we interpret them. Uh, or the fourth one is that they neither exist nor don't exist after death, because perhaps both of those concepts are not relevant. The Buddha refused all four of these. In other words, he refused to say it was any of those. Um, and that seems to lead, uh, leave us in a quandary. I mean, and it's a confusing quandary. And so King Pasenadi was asking Bhikkhuni Kema about this. What does this mean? How do we interpret this? How do we understand this? And Bhikkhuni Kema answered with a couple of similes. She said that just as even somebody who is very diligent and thorough is not going to be able to count all the grains of sand on the banks of the Ganges River, just as an equally thorough and diligent a person is not going to be able to uh, measure out how much water is in the oceans, uh, so too, she said, an enlightened being is deep, immeasurable, and hard to fathom. So she takes the question of what happens to the Buddha after death as having to do with measuring the Buddha, with comparing him in some way. And she's saying that uh, the Buddha, and indeed any enlightened being, is in a sense immeasurable. They've, another way to put this is they've cut off all of their five aggregates in some respect. Uh, they no longer cling to them. Now, what are the five aggregates? These are basically the way that we uh, split up the body and the mind in early Buddhism. Uh, there's the aggregate of the body, uh, that we have a body, which is also in parts. Uh, we have various mental parts, we, we uh, uh, perception, volitions, feeling, consciousness. So these are the five aggregates. I've done a video on that. I'll leave a link to that one as well if you don't know about the five aggregates. But as you see, it's basically splitting up the person into parts. And the Buddha has, has no longer got clinged to any of these parts. He no longer identifies with any of these parts. So as it's said, one of the expressions in early Buddhism is he's really no longer measured by any of these parts. There's another early sutta that, that points out that we are measured by or described by that which uh, obsesses us, that, that which we cling to. So, for example, if we cling to our physical beauty, if we cling to the form aggregate, which is our physical form or body, if we cling to our beauty, if we identify with our beauty, if we're obsessed with being beautiful, then for the Buddha, we're measured by beauty. It's beauty that makes us who we are. We, uh, we're described by our beauty. That's what's important to us. And in a traditional understanding, that's what then will lead us to be reborn. Um, that, it's, it's something having to do with our beauty, something having to do with our obsessions and our clingings that causes us literally to be reborn into the next life. Or we might say in a more uh, metaphorical way, we're reborn into the next moment through our ideas of our own beauty. It's our own beauty that keeps us going, if you like. Uh, that is to say, what we think about the next morning will depend upon those same obsessions, those same clingings. But since an enlightened person is no longer uh, identified with such things, and since an enlightened person is no longer clinging to them, no longer obsessed by them, they're no longer described by them. Uh, and uh, so therefore, they are beyond description in that sense. And this, if we understand what the, what the word description means in early Buddhism in this kind of context, 
It's still somewhat obscure, somewhat subtle, uh, somewhat difficult to understand, but in any event, that's what Bhikkhuni Kema says, and at the end of the sutta then it says that the Buddha gave exactly the same uh, answer when asked by King Pasenadi, and so what she said is absolutely what she should have said. Now to turn to her poem in the Terigata, uh, Bhikkhuni Kema begins by celebrating her lack of sense desire. Uh, clearly, early on in her life, uh, she was more attracted to objects of the senses, to sensual things. But now that she has become uh, enlightened, she's given that up and no longer has such uh, sense desires, and that's what she celebrates in the early part of the poem. However, uh, it seems in the poem that Mara comes to tempt her in the guise of what seems to be a sort of a Brahmin man, that is to say a man of the uh, Vedic Brahmin type uh, who were around at the time. They were uh, companions of, of Buddhists, and indeed many Buddhists were had begun as Vedic Brahmins. And uh, so Mara tempts her, Mara tries to knock her off her pins, if you like, but she has a very a stern response for this, for Mara, where she responds to him like she might to a, an annoying sort of youthful Brahmin. She says, You honor the stars, look to them for guidance. You tend the fire in the forest. Fools, you thought all that could be relied on, all the while not knowing what really is. But I honor the Buddha best of all men. By doing what the Buddha taught, I am freed from all sufferings. So Bhikkhuni Kema has two things to say to Mara. First, that he relies on the stars, and second, that he keeps up this fire in the forest, the sacred fire. These are sorts of things that Brahmins of the day would have done. They would have looked to, uh, to the world for omens and, and portents and messages the physical world, looking to the stars, trying to gain a better life for themselves, uh, trying perhaps to, to gain more success in having children or more success in wealth or power, fame. Also, they would be keeping this sacred fire, which was a way for them to sacrifice to the deities, uh, make obeisance, make kind, uh, you know, different kinds of prayer to the deities through this fire, which was something that the Brahmins of the time did. And that also is a way of coming up with success in life. These are the ways that the Vedas talked about finding success in, in having cattle, in, ha in having uh, a large family, in, again, having wealth and power and fame, was through getting the gods on your side through, again, sacrifices of various kinds, prayer, as well as keeping an eye on the omens in the sky. So what she is saying is that's what Mara wants you to do, that's what the Brahmins want you to do, that's what sort of contemporary society wanted you to do, and indeed to an extent even nowadays wants you to do. But on the other hand, what she does is to follow the Buddha's way, which is a way of practice which is a way that does not involve such interests in these objects of the world, in, in, in making nice with the gods so as to gain uh, worldly ends. Because such worldly ends themselves also lead to dukkha. They lead also to various kinds of suffering in the longer term. Whereas if you want to find the highest benefit, which is to overcome suffering uh, thoroughly, then what you need to do is dharma practice. Now, the irony here, of course, with all of this, is that uh, in, in many uh, forms of Buddhism nowadays, the bhikkhuni lineage, the lineage of nuns, has died out, or at least is in danger of remaining died out. And uh, although there have been some important uh, movements to get it restarted. And I did an earlier video on that, and I'll leave a link to that up on the screen here if you haven't seen that video. Thanks so much to all my patrons over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Without you, this would not be possible. And thanks for watching. Hope we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.